for swiping um, the phone. So now I hope that we will be able to talk almost as an offline event. I already thought that uh, that's a great pity that we have no opportunity to start with real coffee break and all these nice chats that we usually hold. But I do believe that sooner or later we'll be able to repeat it uh, online, uh, either in Moscow or in any of the uh, cities that our participants present today. Now I would like to deliver the word to Timofey Bordachev, who will moderate the first session. Timofey Bordachev is a research supervisor of Center for Comprehensive European and International Studies of National Research University, Higher School of Economics, and Pro director of Eurasian program of Valdai Discussion Club. So, Dr. Bordachev, welcome. The flow is yours. Yes, uh, Nastya, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Good afternoon to our Chinese participants. I'm very glad to welcome you all for this uh, conference, which we have been preparing for a couple of months, uh, together with the Eurasian Economic Commission and inviting a couple of very good friends and prominent researchers from all over the world. So, and I think that this online, uh, online opportunity gives us uh, the unique chance not only to test these new technical capabilities but also to get those people for whom the traveling to moscow could have been a very long time for taken a long time and um, since there is a reasonable distance between us so we have our first session of this conference uh, devoted to the eurasian economic union strategies in the age of the new protectionism uh, the new protectionism is a term which pretends to be, which pretends to be scientific, invented by our research team during the last couple of months uh, it, within the project of cooperation with Eurasian Economic Commission, with the kind assistance and participation of our friends from Minsk University, from Belarus. Thank you very much, Mr. Shadursky and from the couple of other universities around uh, the member states of Eurasian Economic Union. So under the term new protectionism, we mean the combination of trade wars and sanctions, but not in the classic form of these uh, unfortunate events as something which is unusual and actually bad for the global economy and international politics, but something which will stay with us forever. Something which becomes, uh, with the modern conditions, one of the, those normalities, which we might do not like, but which we need to deal with and uh, try to size opportunities which emerge uh, under these new protectionism trends in the world economy. We have a couple of excellent speakers for the first panel and for the second panel as well. Uh, we uh, conduct our conference in English uh, to, for the comfort of our international participants from the US, from China, from all around the world. And uh, we have about 10 minutes for the first introductory remarks of Dr. Karaganov, who generously agreed to participate this morning in our conference. And we have about five, seven, five up to seven minutes for each speaker mentioned in the program. We have about seven speakers. All of them are well distinguished. But uh, the, the, the only one thing which I wanted to say before we start uh, is that my, so far my experience of conducting the seminars and public discussions in online uh, confirms that we need to be a little bit faster than in the usual life, than in offline. Otherwise, it is very difficult for people to follow, and if we lose the timing, uh, it becomes uh, just another offline conference, but a little bit more boring. So online dictates the rules of the game and dictates me to be very strict on the timing, so please accept my apologies in advance for those whom I will need to kindly uh, remind that the time of, for the speaking is over. So we work for about one hour, 30 minutes, one hour, 40 minutes, to half past 12 Moscow time, 40 past 12 Moscow time. So if I didn't miss anything essential, if I did miss something essential, 
Dr. Lihachova will edit and correct me. Uh, but if I did not, uh, I am very glad to pass the floor to, to give a microphone uh, to invite uh, Dr. Karagan for his uh, initial kick off presentation regarding the international strategies of the Eurasian Economic Union. Dr. Karaganov, thank you very much. We anticipate your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to see you all, all friends, uh, some new faces. Uh, 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 you made my, uh, your uh, remarks, you made my uh, task easier because first I was asked to make introductory remarks. Then I was asked to make a keynote speech for 15 minutes. Uh, I, I, I noticed that only yesterday late in the evening. So I uh, woke up uh, at five o'clock and uh, drafted uh, uh, a keynote speech. Uh, I mean, uh, supported by three nightingales. Uh, nevertheless, the, now I'll have to cut it short. Uh, so uh, first, uh, the uh, sanctions uh, protectionism uh, is an objective uh, feature uh, which will accompany us uh, uh, throughout uh, several, one or two or three decades. Uh, the key reason of this rise of protectionism, economic nationalism, uh, use of sanctions, uh, is uh, the basic shift uh, which uh, happened uh, over the last uh, several, or uh, two or three decades, but especially during the last decade, uh, when uh, the West, which uh, had had uh, uh, a military uh, preponderance, had had uh, for 500 years, uh, started first to lose it and then finally lost it uh, uh, during the last uh, decade, probably forever. Uh, this uh, uh, military preponderance was the basis uh, for political, uh, economic, and cultural. Uh, preponderance and hegemony in the West had had. Uh, uh, so we uh, and uh, the rules of uh, the uh, economic game were based uh, base, uh, were based uh, on the system uh, which uh, was in a, in a in a second layer uh, based on this military preponderance. Um, first, of course, in non-Soviet world, then in all the world in the whole world for 10 or 15 years, uh, and now is uh, crushing. So uh, the, uh, the loss of military superiority had two or had three repercussions. One is uh, that uh, United States first, but gradually other Western nations are losing interest in liberal economic uh, system because they could not dictate the rules. Uh, so. Uh, the separate re repercussion is, of course, uh, uh, the uh, widening of use of uh, economic weapons for political uh, means, uh, because uh, the West, uh, and by the way, and other countries too, uh, could not uh, use raw force uh, anymore or as widely as it used to be. Uh, that doesn't mean that only West uh, uses uh, economic uh, sanctions and for political reasons. We all know that uh, Russia does that. Uh, we, we know that uh, China does it uh, or has been doing that. Uh, but of course, uh, the, uh, the United States uh, is in the lead. Uh, and of course, then uh, protectionism is based on the very simple, uh, the wave of protectionism is uh, based, uh, based on the very simple uh, calculation. Uh, if you could not uh, if, you don't, if you lose the system which uh, gave you a possibility to uh, siphon off a world GNP uh, in your favor, uh, then I mean you uh, use whatever two tools you have um, uh, uh, to curve your part uh, of the world GNP. It's that simple. And of course, the, uh, the uh, comma the, uh, today. A situation with the uh, with the epidemics will only exacerbate the situation. Mm. Uh, it will not change the course of the history. It will probably, in most cases, simply exacerbate the existing trends. Uh, 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 it could play a historic role, a historic role 
um, by because of two reasons. Uh, the epidemics is not uh, by by historic standards, even by the standards of the 20th century, uh, is not overwhelming. Uh, it is a medium-sized epidemics, but it was it it, it was uh, uh, quartered uh, by uh, the fact that uh, many elites in many countries decided to provide uh, to use it for, as a cover-up for their past uh, uh, inconsistencies, mistakes, uh, uh, so sometimes uh, mis mistakes, uh, incompetence, uh, inadequate policies uh, in economic fields, in uh, political, social uh, fields. The epidemics is used as a small uh, uh, as a substitute for a small war, a war which uh, writes off uh, many of these mistakes. Uh, it, it happens everywhere, and I just wonder why in Russia is uh, so much uh, joining uh, uh, this wave. Uh, the second, uh, but, but it, it became uh, worse, and, and actually cubed, was cubed uh, by the modern uh, media. Uh, which uh, made it a desert machine and uh, created a kind of a s uh, situation where uh, the, pandem the pandemic, bad enough, uh, grew out of all uh, proportions. So uh, it will strengthen the, uh, all the tendency to towards disintegration uh, of the world economic system. It will, uh, it is strengthening uh, nationalism, it is strengthening Hopefully, regionally, but I but I will address that issue um, uh, a, a bit later. Uh, it was uh, it is strengthening inequality. Uh, the poor will become poorer, while uh, the rich will become a little bit poorer, but nevertheless uh, rich. Uh, the only positive effect of these uh, epidemics uh, is uh, and of, uh, of the whole cloud around these epidemics is that possibly. Uh, and I hope so, it will return humanity uh, and all of us to normal uh, values. Uh, life, family, uh, your country, a service uh, to the community. And uh, again, not uh, the, media, uh, uh, the media person, but hopefully doctors, um, uh, policemen, engineers uh, will return uh, to the center of our uh, societies. Uh, but uh, so uh, we will uh, see a uh, continuation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the tendencies which we have been witnessing for the last approximately 10 years, uh, including, I mean, uh, decrease of the uh, um, share of trade uh, in world economy. Uh, we have uh, noticed, have been noticing for about five years now it will be uh, strengthened, but of course I would like to hear your views on that uh, by uh, this uh, cutting of all uh, of many of the connections. Uh, whereas, uh, in, in, in addition to uh, uh, po political uh, po politicization of trade, uh, economic ties. Uh, uh, which have been seen in a mostly positive way, and economic interdependence, which has been seen in a mostly positive way, will um, uh, probably uh, see be seen uh, or uh, in a more negative way. I don't know what will be the balance, but it is clear that most countries, uh, many countries, will uh, try to turn as much as possible to autarky. We see the uh, United States is um, trying to move uh, back um, uh, production. We see the growing debate in Europe. Um, I think uh, we will have that uh, in, in Russia uh, too. Uh, whether it is a positive element in the future, uh, in the future, uh, uh, in our economic future or not, we do not know. Uh, but it is clear that the onus uh, of uh, benefits 
uh, we'll move from purely economical to political. And uh, that would strengthen uh, their uh, case for autarky. Uh, uh, liberalism uh, will be suffering for at least several uh, decades, hopefully less, uh, but uh, a decade is for sure, uh, until we uh, find a new balance, uh, political, economic, and military. Uh, uh, and on that basis, we could start uh, to create new rules. Now, the uh, process which we are witnessing, and now I am coming directly to the uh, issue of Eurasian Economic Union, the process we are witnessing also uh, spell um, uh, destruction of many of the institutions, economic, especially economic institutions, which provided for the tendency of uh, integration. Uh, let me just remind you uh, what is happening with, the, oh, with most of the major organizations. WTO, where is it? European Union, stumbling down. Uh, OPEC, G20, which was, I mean, the last hope uh, for international uh, coordination of economic policies, uh, uh, is also uh, uh, falling apart, especially the, after the last session, where they couldn't even reach a, uh, uh, an agreement on how to conduct it. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the only institution in which uh, uh, so far survive, uh, survive is uh, ASEAN. So what, is, what about the Eurasian Economic Union? In principle, of course, uh, uh, many, some of the tendencies which we are witnessing in the world uh, call for a closer integration. Uh, Eurasian Economic Union provides, is the major provider of sovereignty and uh, uh, the sovereignty is uh, the call of today and tomorrow uh, because it uh, gives uh, uh, smaller countries of, Euro uh, of, uh, uh, of the Union uh, a possibility uh, to stand up uh, to their powerful uh, neighbors. Uh, it is probably one of the biggest sources of uh, sovereignty. Uh, it gives them uh, some economic uh, protection in the wider market. But I'm not sure whether uh, these positive tendencies will uh, prevail uh, as, as of yet. Uh, first, we have uh, in our countries a largely parochial and, uh, 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 and provincially thinking elites, uh, which look for immediate economic and political benefits rather than for a long term. Uh, uh, that uh, me uh, that uh, that is not that I'm criticizing our neighbors and our friends. I'm criticizing uh, my my own Rus Russian elite, uh, which looks at the union uh, with some skepticism. Uh, thanks God, politically, uh, we are supporting it uh, on the highest level, but many in the economic uh, uh, circles of our country believe that it gives us less than others or sometimes simply ties our hands. Uh, so uh, we have to think now very seriously about the future of Eurasian Economic Union uh, because it will, like all like institutions, uh, go, through, uh, go uh, through a difficult uh, period. And uh, we need a new political impetus uh, to continue and to uh, 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 and to develop uh, the union, which is, as I said, as I, as I said, a uh, very va valuable instrument uh, for upkeeping our sovereignty in this dangerous world. Uh, and uh, uh, we need uh, that for maybe for other uh, political reasons. But whether the union will flourish, I'm not sure. It will survive. Uh, because it has already developed very powerful uh, inertia and it has a strong bureaucracy. Uh, but this bureaucracy lately has not been very effective uh, and we do not see actually uh, the um, Eurasian Economic Union on the present day uh, surface, though of course work uh, continues underneath. Uh, so we have to think uh, very thoroughly about the 
future Eurasian integra integration uh, because it will be challenged by many of the tendencies of the contemporary and future world. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Karaganov. May I ask you a question? I want to abuse my right of the moderator. <laughs> Uh, well, as you are uh, the most prominent Russian foreign policy strategist, what do you think uh, about the impact on Eurasian Economic Union of the current developments in the relationships between the US and China? We all now speak about only this. Some of the colleagues already call it the new Cold War. Uh, so, uh, but definitely there is a confrontation. And there are objective reasons for this confrontation between China and the United States. So what do you think is going to be the strategic impact of this on Eurasian economic integration? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it, it, uh, it, will be, it will not very, be very strong uh, because Eurasian economic uh, integration is uh, not that important for that kind of a confrontation. But obviously China will uh, put more emphasis on trying to line up uh, uh, the smaller members of the Eurasian Economic Union around its confrontation uh, with the United States, while the United States will try, or uh, Europe, but to a lesser extent, uh, will try to weaken the Eurasian Economic Union. So that these are the tendencies which I have not mentioned, and thank you for answering uh, for asking that question. Um, I think that will be one of the uh, challenges for uh, for our union and one of the reasons uh, why we should um, uh, be more energetic uh, in uh, developing it and building it up uh, because there will be a pressure especially from China that is a simple objective mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much dr. Karaganov now I wanted to uh, give her to give the microphone to our uh, colleague from Minsk uh, Mr. Shadursky, uh, Dean, Faculty of the International Relations of Belarusian State University. Basically, Mr. Shadursky, you are head of the Belarusian Mgimo or Belarusian Princeton University. Oh. And cultivate... So many compliments, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you cult since you cultivate the Belar the, those, who, those who make the Belarusian foreign policy under the orders of your president. So, uh, Mr. Shadursky, the title of your lecture is The Factors of the Eurasian Economic Union Integration Slow Down. So, you go it slow down. Uh, well, uh, I have just to kick off before your presentation, before your speech, uh, I wanted just right away to raise the question about uh, what is the, in your opinion, is the nature of this temporary slowdown, which actually has been already mentioned in one of the speeches of Mr. Mesnikovic. So, uh, this, this slowdown for you means that, that the countries, the member states, are less interested in integration or they want to renegotiate some issues to improve their internal balances within their functioning uh, mechanism with which they are generally satisfied. Mr. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I will um, discuss uh, with you. I will talk about the challenge uh, internal challenges, uh, I mean, inter internal challenges of Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, what our answer to uh, external, external um, ch challenges? Uh, sure, the creation of Eurasian Economic Union is the real answer to the global challenges. Uh, certainly, the Union will open broad opportunities for establishing a large market to revive the former close economic cooperation. Because we had in our history very, very close economic cooperation. Um, at the same time, the current process of integration does not meet the expectation of both the authority structure and society. You know, there are a lot of jokes, uh, there are a lot of critics uh, to, to, uh, toward the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, and the people, uh, journalists, media declare that uh, Eurasian Economic Union has not so many stories of success stories. Certainly, it's clear that we need, our union needs, uh, needs more um, successful stories. 
the leaders of their member states admitted that it's not possible to create transparent and fair rules for the common game and to organize the implementation of undertaken obligation. Also, you know that uh, uh, it and during the meeting on the top level, um, there are a lot of discussion about common rules and how to uh, to make them more uh, more strict or how how uh, 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 so on. The leaders of the uh, yeah you, uh, you, uh, we have a lot of information from the meeting of uh, summit. It turned out that formation of the union did not coincide with the best economic period. Really, Eurasian Economic Union is a very good structure, very perspective structure, but uh it was uh, uh it was created uh, uh, not in the good economic period uh, the last six year, years the year so the ukrainian crisis the sanctions the conflict between russia and the collective west and there is no coordination between the member states in uh, that direction one can even say that uh, Eurasian Economic Union was not lucky this geopolitical and geoeconomic situation at the time of its birth and at the first year of its development. I would like just to add some couple uh, reasons. Certainly maybe uh, it's not global reasons, but uh, internal, uh, internal problems. Who is to blame? Uh, there are certainly many reasons for the slowdown of the integration processes. I would like uh, to point out as one of the reasons, on my opinion, the long transition period of the Eurasian Economic Union member states to a more balanced and stable political system. In this condition of transition period, in my opinion, various expectations from integration arise, short-term interests dominate. And Sergei Alexandrovich uh, said about that. Figuratively speaking, life uh, follows the principle of Malchishki Balchish, uh, the hero of the novel Military Secret by Arkady Gaidar. We only have to stand a day and hold out a night. The political situation affects the fact that young people in our countries, um, concretely, particularly in Belarus, are reluctant to talk about the future of states, even in five-year perspective. And this, uh, uh, this is uh, the time when the Chinese or German, Germans discuss the vision of their country in 2000. 50. I asked Austin, please, uh, uh, what are your expectations for the future of our country? No, not so, it, not, not enthusiasm at all. It's, I think also th this is a result of our one situation. We think, we think about the perspective in a short, short term uh, period, but uh, for, uh, I, I talk about Belarus, I don't, uh, I don't know exactly about Russian young people, students, but it's also the result of our present day political situation. What to do? First, the dialogue should not be limited to the national level. We observe a lot of conflicts on the top level, very strong discussion, there are, there are a lot of blames and so on. Uh, but in uh, the ex existing condition, it's necessary to strengthen less politicized regional cooperation, so-called low politic, actively develop integration project within our union in the border areas. I think that the leaders, public associations, business structures, Smolensk and Vitebsk regions, for example, will find many concrete proposals and practical initiatives with the necessary support from above. Those projects can give dynamics to interstate processes and strengthen much needed public support. I, I told you about this factor, public support. Maybe it's necessary to think about creating inter-regional inter structures and institutions. Uh, we know that there are structures or inter-regional structures in the, in the frame of European Union and they're quite uh, successful. Maybe we think uh, about uh, that in in frame of our union. Second, uh, second point, another important issue of the integration association is the functioning of the Eurasian Economic Union Court. Obviously, within the framework of such a large economic association, various disputes between business entities, national ministries, and departments are inevitable. It's necessary to think about the effective judicial mechanism in the union which would be trusted by all parties. The member of the court 
should objectively consider emerging, uh, emerging, emerging situation and not adhere to the attitude of interest of a particular country. Uh, you know, the court of Europe, Eurasian Economy Union has no affairs, have no, has, in, in reality, have they uh, got only two cases. Uh, and uh, there is the official structure, the center of the structure, you know, is located in Minsk, but no results, no discussion, no input to development of our integration. The advisory nature of the decision of the court does not benefit integration. Under these conditions, competing structures uh, may arise. For example, uh, there is a very strong attempt to create court of the Astana International Financial Center, Center in Nur Sultan. Yeah, and uh, certainly, of course, uh, the list of urgent problems are very wide and the discussion continues. Thank you for your short attention, I think. I didn't spend a lot of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Shadursky. Uh, uh, I want now to, we have, we have a couple of international speakers. We have a couple of uh, the local speakers. I want now to invite Dr. Alne Melcher. Dr. Melcher, are you with us? I unmute my microphone. I'm with you, yes. Excellent, excellent, splendid. We can hear you very well. Uh, Dr. Melcher is a senior research fellow in the Norwegian Institute of International Relations, famous, uh, famous NUPI, and his uh, topic of their presentation is the new protectionism and systemic crisis. What does this mean for the Eurasian Economic Union? Uh, Mr. Melcher, please, the floor is yours. We are anticipating your unique analysis. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, um, I wish you all the best also fighting the coronavirus, so I hope we can meet in person uh, at the next stage. So, uh, so uh, <clears throat> I, yes, I, I will use these slides partially, you can change to the next. Yes. Yes, so, so uh, part of my talk will be based on these two uh, publications, a book from 2018, where uh, the world is split into seven major regions, so uh, Eastern Europe is one of the regions. So uh, there is a lot of tr analysis there of trade patterns and also uh, simulations of a world trade model showing various uh, trade policy issues. There is also the article in the Russian Journal of Economics from 2019, which is about Russia in world trade between globalism and regionalism. So these are kind of sources if you want to look more into the arguments I make. Uh, so, so new protectionism, what does it mean? Uh, it's of course uh, partly a cyclical phenomenon that we always have that in uh, times of, uh, of lower economic growth, uh, uh, you will have some protectionist elements and you had uh, you have slower world trade growth over the last years and some more protectionism. But this is a kind of regular issue that uh, many countries would agree that we should uh, try to limit as much as we can. But then it's a problem with the United States, uh, which under President Trump, of course, has switched policies and introduced new trade policy measures that are essentially protectionist. Uh, so President Trump, he rejects multilateralism and he likes protectionism. And, uh, but Europe does not agree. Uh, so, uh, so there is not a widespread uh, rejection of multilateralism. There are many countries in the world that support the WTO and that support the environmental agreements, etc. So, so an issue in trade is whether Russia as a large power could benefit from bilateralism, where you are less bound by uh, global agreements and weaker rules. And uh, so my answer is essentially no, and I will um, provide some arguments for it. And I think that uh, the World Trade Organization is essentially successful in the field of trading goods. It's a bit less successful in terms of trading services, but uh, the peaceful conflict resolution is an excellent thing about the WTO. So, yeah, we can switch uh, slides. Yeah. So the systemic uh, crisis of the WTO is partly a USA problem because it is actually the USA that has blocked this good settlement. 
uh, and uh, Mr. Trump is not really searching for solutions, but polarization. Uh, as I said, he rejects multilateralism in principle. Um, this is also, in, in addition to the USA problem, it's a broader problem. It's caused by uh, China's growth and the new world economic map and the relative decline of some of the, the old industrial nations. So, for example, there is a lack of reciprocity in trade and investment policy, so rich countries are more open than uh, intermediate uh, in economies. This is an historical fact, but this becomes more of a problem when you have China, which is such a, a huge exporter, capturing so many global markets. And also uh, the limited dissidents on subsidies and state-owned enterprises, they matter more because of the size of China. So when China uh, changes their steel industry, it affects the world much more than if an African country does it. So these are uh, difficult to solve, but on the, on the whole, of course, in the WTO, for example, now there is this inter, interim uh, solution to dispute settlement where many countries uh, join, Norway, the European Union, China. I have not yet seen Russia on the list, but I hope Russia will also uh, join this effort to kind of save the, uh, the multilateralism in dispute settlements. So you can switch. The, so turning to the economic arguments, uh, this graph here shows uh, the share of intra-regional trade in total goods trade for world regions in 1995, 2005, and 15. And there you see that, for example, in Western Europe, this share to the far right is high but slightly declining. But if you look at Eastern Europe, it is, it is low and declining. So the share of intra-regional trade in Eastern Europe was 19% of total trade. So this is the kind of a key fact which is important for the EAEU. Uh, this is, of course, partly because of commodity uh, uh, production and exports, oil and other commodities, and also the economic density in the, in the post-Soviet space. So this means that Russia and the EAEU, they are kind of globalists uh, and has to trade with the world. And so the EAEU is very good, but there are limits because of the structural phenomenon. So we can change. And so I, in this article from last year, I simulated some very stylized and kind of unrealistic scenarios if you make deep and equivalent cuts in trade barriers in various mixes what are the gains for, for Russia? So the figure shows this for Russia, and you see that uh, full integration or deep integration in the CIS is much smaller than integration with China, with the EU. The FTI raises that Russia um, uh, makes free trade agreements with all countries in the world. And the, finally, the multilateral is the WTO solution where you have the uh, same integration, but multilaterally also between all other countries. Yeah, so this is very stylized, of course, and probably unrealistic, but in a way it says that, uh, that uh, you, can, uh, you can achieve more by global integration by, than by intra-regional integration. Yeah, so we can switch. Yeah, so, so in the sense, you could say that EAU makes sense and it's a good thing, but it's one third of the solution because you need to trade with the world. Russia needs it, other countries need to do so. Uh, and the multilateral liberalization as supported by WTO is good for Russia because you need to be a global trader. It also matters that Russia is not a superpower in trade, it's a medium-sized trader and will also be vulnerable under bilateralism uh, as many other kind of medium-sized traders. So I uh, suggest that Russia and the EAU should uh, join others to defend multilateralism. Uh, EAU could be more proactive on FTAs. There is more to gain from that. An interesting result from this article I wrote last year is that uh, trade liberalization may also promote diversification industrially, so there is no reason to pair that liberal trade will make you even more commodity reliant. 
so this globalism is also important for Russia's neighbors and, uh, and prosperity of the neighbors is also important for Russia. And uh, you can look to Norway where we have independent trade policies at the same time as we have deep integration uh, in the so-called European economic area. So we have our own trade agreements at the same time as we are deeply integrated in the internal market of Europe. So, so this is also a kind of possible model that you could think of varieties of in the Eastern European setting. Uh, of course, now with uh, still sanctions remaining, trade policies constrained by geopolitics and the EFTA, Russia negotiations were, uh, were put on hold, so we must really hope for a solution. So thank you very much. I hope I kept the uh, time limit. Thank you very much, Dr. Melchior, for your very much in-depth investigations uh, on how the global economic circumstances uh, might affect the efficiency of the international integration uh, and the development of the countries. So I definitely understood more about the possibilities, the possible options for the Eurasian Economic Strategy Union, but I also understood better why Norway never joins Euro European Union. So, uh, and I do understand better your argument behind not joining European Union whilst not having the political reasons of doing so. Since Norway is a member of NATO and fully integrated and protected part of the Western international community, which is not the case for the Eurasian Economic Union member states, and they, of course, need to take into consideration the political factor, which is always behind their international economic intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, excellent. Now I want, uh, want you to comment on this uh, uh, membership or not? No, uh, no, 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 no. I just wanted just just um, abuse of my position of moderator. Uh, so, so, excellent. Thank you very much. I give a floor to Dr. Igor Makarov, uh, the head of uh, the Depart Department uh, of Econ International Economy of the Faculty of World Economy and International Relations, National Research University High School of Economics. Igor, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bordachev. Uh, I will focus in my presentation on the concept of new protectionism and so on the specifics of the protectionism uh, we have faced for the last decades, uh, for the last decade, and so probably we will uh, continue to face in, in coming decades. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in order to understand the specifics of this protectionism, we should uh, also look at the evolution the protectionism uh, has passed since World War uh, the Second. Uh, actually, the protectionism existed forever, but it was very different. So until the 1980s, the standard protectionism dominated. In developed countries, it was uh, primarily mercantilist in nature. Uh, so the idea of protection measures was to protect national producers, Sometimes it was driven by domestic industrial lobbies, which were interested in protection from foreign competitors. And in principle, this kind of protectionism was, uh, especially in developed countries, it was addressed efficiently, firstly by GATT, then by the WTO. Uh, in developing countries, in many developing countries, such protectionism was a part of developmental state policy. Uh, when the objective was to protect some infant industries, especially in high tech sector, uh, and launch the industrialization in developing countries. Uh, but this kind of protectionism, developmental protectionism, it started to decline with the spread of global value chains in the 1990s, uh, because in order to launch industrialization uh, in conditions of global value chains, it became much more beneficial just to join the value chains led by Western multinationals than uh, to try to protect its own non-competitive uh, non industrial companies, I mean, from the perspective of developing countries. And as a result, many developing countries, they shifted from protectionist policy to, towards uh, some lifting barriers uh, to the trade, especially to the trading components, and creation of free trade areas with the developed countries, uh, joining the WTO, and so on. 
Starting from the 1980s, uh, the new protectionism appeared, and it was the term new protectionism that appeared that time already in the 1980s. It was called new protectionism. This protectionism was based on non-tariff measures. Uh, they were not addressed directly by God, uh, and uh, they were much more complicated uh, uh, to control than under the WTO in the 1990s and in, to, in the 2000s. Uh, and the objectives of this new protectionism uh, based on non-tariff measures, they were much more complex. Partly, they also remained mercantilist, just take agricultural subsidies in the European Union, for example. The objective was to protect national business. Uh, partly, these non-tariff measures were implemented to protect some national institutions. For example, uh, take different safety standards, sanitary standards. They were aimed to protect some national values and national standards that were uh, chosen even sometimes democratically by, by the population of the countries which implemented these measures. And partly these non-tariff measures uh, started to be used, especially by Western countries, to deter their competitors. For example, take uh, the most important case, uh, so-called voluntary export restraints imposed by the, uh, by, by, uh, on Japanese exports to, to the United States. Uh, now we see the, uh, uh, the other kind of protectionism. Uh, it may be called some new, new protectionism. Uh, it comes from the West, uh, and uh, primarily from the United States, but not only. Uh, I don't uh, think that it is only the issue of Trump and so when uh, the new president of the United States uh, appears, this protectionism will vanish. Uh, it comes from, from the, the Western countries and it uses, it uses both tariff and non-tariff measures and it is 100% politically driven, not economically driven, but politically driven. Partly its drivers belong to the area of domestic politics. Uh, rising in inequality and the industrialization in developed countries raise the question about distributive consequences of trade and distributive uh, consequences, distributive impacts of trade became much more important for most of political leaders than welfare impacts of uh, trade and liberalization. Uh, so non-qualified labor force in uh, Western countries, they it claims for the job protection uh, it, and politicians seem much more political benefits for them to follow these claims, the view of uh, non-qualified labor force, then uh, just to continue trade liberalization. Partly the drivers of this new, new protectionism uh, belong to the area of international relations. Uh, the West loses its hegemony, tries to deter the new emerging powers, primarily China, uh, and this international relations dimension uh, it may be illustrated by trade war with China, it may be illustrated by sanctions, by politicization of uh, international trade policy, and so on. How strong is this new new protectionism, uh, may, how strong it may be, we could see in uh, 2019, uh, when the global exports fell by 3%, and it is unprecedented fall, uh, given that the world economy was not in crisis, it was uh, it demonstrated uh, economic growth, not so quick as, as previously, but still the economic growth was more or less normal, but the global exports fell by 3%, and uh, primarily it was the result of, of trade wars. So uh, the, uh, the uh, impact of, uh, of this new, new protectionism on, on the global trade is, uh, is really very important. After coronavirus pandemic, the new new protectionism, it would not vanish. It has structural drivers, and uh, these structural drivers, like inequality and the industrialization in Western countries, growing West-China uh, tensions, will still be the case. Moreover, I, I expect that uh, the conventional mercantilist protectionism would also come back, because uh, the governments would try to protect their national business in conditions of uh, deep economic crisis. Uh, and so protectionism is one of the standard ways to do it, especially given the uh, crisis of the WTO. And again, I do not believe that the crisis of WTO is a case of Trump, and uh, it is a, uh, the result of just only Trump, Trump's uh, policies. 
the crisis of the WTO it started much earlier. It started from the early 2000s when uh, it's, uh, the, the results of Doha round may be uh, one of the illustrations of this, uh, of this deep crisis of the WTO and so on. Uh, so I think that uh, also the new security drivers uh, of uh, protectionism may appear uh, during the pandemic uh, because global value chains are now too risky in the conditions of uh, the uh, COVID-19. Uh, and the reliance on domestic production would strengthen uh, without any doubt. Uh, food security concerns will, would rise uh, all over the world. So in coming years, we will face uh, the ideal storm of protectionism. So we have never seen so many argue, uh, arguments in favor of uh, protectionism in modern history. So from absolutely different motivations, uh, all the major economies would be pushed towards more protectionism. And so I really agree with the title of this conference, which is uh, called uh, The Strategies of the Eurasian Economic Union in uh, the Era of New uh, Protectionism. I really believe that it is a, a, the beginning of the new era. It is uh, not the issue that will uh, go away in, in a decade or will go away when the global economy uh, like recover after this uh, economic crisis, where, uh, whenever it's, uh, it will recover. Uh, I think that we are at the, in the beginning of the uh, very long period of uh, rising uh, protectionism. And uh, I think that the Eurasian Economic Union uh, should uh, adapt itself to this new uh, long-term reality. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation and very, very deep and, in, and uh, intellectually well cooked comments. Uh, I noticed one uh, significant difference between those who are doing pol international politics and those who are doing international economics. We international politics always believe that something bad is forever. And as economists, you need to prove that something bad is forever because economists generally don't believe in it. <laughs> so we are in a more pessimistic position initially. Uh, thank you very much, Igor. I give a floor to our friend, uh, Carter Johnson, our, our visiting from Canada, with his presentation, what lessons can be learned about new protectionism and the use of sanctions for the international community during this period of new protectionism. Uh, Carter, thank you very much in advance, and our organizers remind me that I should keep in line in, in terms of our timing. Carter, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Спасибо, уважаемые коллеги, и спасибо за приглашение. Мне очень жаль, что я не могу практиковать свой русский язык, но английский то английский. Uh, I'll just, uh, you know, my, my area of expertise is, is uh, domestic civil wars, and it might strike some as unusual for someone of my background to be speaking about international trade and, and, uh, and trade wars and, and sanctions. Uh, what I want to suggest is perhaps counterintuitively that the study of civil wars offers a unique perspective on trade wars and sanctions and, and institutions and, and trust that's often underappreciated by IR scholars. And I, and I think that the civil wars are relevant here because countries that experience civil wars often reflect the, the anarchic system uh, that you find in international affairs. It's these countries that the, the central government has lost control of its territory and finds patchworks of different regions controlled by different mini governments um, which, are, which are analogous and, and similar to states in the international system. And so that's how I want to, to view that, uh, view these, these uh, systems through that prism. And these central governments often use exactly these types of policies of sanctions and, and trade blockades, embargoes uh, against separatist regions in an attempt either to, to punish, uh, perhaps to change behavior, uh, perhaps to maintain their markets, to reintegrate uh, those territories into their, into their united uh, uh, central markets. And it's these central governments that uh, see the territories as political rivals as much as anything else, uh, much as we're discussing today in the theme of the, of the conference. And this is something that I've been looking at more of, um, policies used against domestic rivals, trade policies against domestic rivals. 
we see, can see examples um, all over the world, uh, especially since uh, the, the post-World War II period. I'm currently, uh, you know, I'm a Canadian, but I'm currently on lockdown in Moldova. Uh, and so I don't have to look very far to find examples of this uh, with, uh, with, with, with Moldova, which used uh, a trade blockade against uh, Transnistria in the early 1990s. Um, we can see it in other neighboring uh, post-Soviet uh, territories, uh, Georgia using it against a, a blockade against Abkhazia in the 1990s. But you can look all over um, the world, Nigeria using it against Biafra uh, during its separatist wars. Um, and there, there are hundreds of other examples, and this is something that uh, a data project that, that I'm, I'm working on now. Um, we can ask several questions from these data that may be relevant both to, to, to international relations and, and today's discussions. Um, and they start from basic ones of do these sanctions and trade embargoes work? Uh, you know, do, they, do they change behavior? Um, and so far the, uh, the answer very much uh, lines up with international relations research on the topic of sanctions, which is overwhelmingly no. Um, both, uh, both the cases I mentioned of Moldova and Georgia, uh, the trade blockades and sanctions didn't change behavior of these local governments, um, not in the 90s and, and not since. Um, and of course, the, the markets were neither protected nor united, although I'll, I'll finish um, on that point about uh, Transnistria's integration into the, the Moldovan uh, market, economic market. Um, and th so this mirrors what we see in, in a lot of the, the studies about uh, sanctions in the international arena, discuss how and demonstrate how sanctions are, are, are very limited in effectiveness in all but a very uh, narrow, narrow few cases. Uh, in some of these cases, like Moldova and Georgia, the situations of sanctions and trade wars become uh, much like uh, Dr. Bordachev uh, noted in his, in his opening uh, comments that uh, this, is, this is the new normal and this, uh, this is not something that will disappear soon. Uh, the second question I think we can ask is, is you know, why are these pursued? Um, why are these so popular and, and, and why are they in fact growing in popularity? Uh, many of us have talked uh, here today already, but the U.S. policies and uh, the last numbers I saw were something like 7,000 different sanctions on individuals and companies across dozens of across dozen, dozens of states. And I think it's a you know a question that's worth discussing about how representative the U.S. policies are compared to other Western countries and other and and, and Russia and China and, and other countries around the world. And I hope that's something that we can return to uh, in in the discussion. Um, but I, I do think that we haven't yet discussed, uh, we haven't studied enough about the motivations of these, of these sanctions. Um, I still think we need to research more about whether the leaders that impose these sanctions might actually believe that these sanctions do work and, and can change behavior. And, and I think this is something that uh, is, is worth re, uh, returning to and, and researching uh, more fully um, as, as, uh, as more data becomes uh, available. Because if leaders do believe these sanctions and trade wars do work, not only to protect their markets, but also to, to, to punish and to change behavior, this will be important. And, and I fear that this is, uh, I fear this may very well be the case. Um, judging from the, the numbers of, of memoirs and, and other uh, uh, documents that have been declassified now, that uh, is beginning to look like it may, may very well be the case. And the third point, you know, returning to the topic of the panel, um, uh, I wanted to ask, you know, what, the, what the study of civil wars can teach us about overcoming these um, crisis of institutions and expectations and, and trust, uh, the, the, the theme of this panel. Um, I think that the literature on these anarchic civil war situations moving from trade wars and sanctions and anarchy to reintegrating territories and, and opening trade tells us at least two lessons that are relevant uh, for the current international order and, and how we might move forward. Um, one is that there's you know, no, no silver bullets to restoring trust. Um, this may not be surprising, but I think it bears repeating given its importance um, that, that this impacts not only the international order, but the, but the domestic order as well. The trust between institutions is both very difficult to obtain and, and very easy to lose. Um, we rarely see trust restored, even in post-Civil War institutions where, where states are uh, where territories are reintegrated, and that can take over a generation um, uh, to, to achieve. Um, but second, and, and this is the point that I'll stop on, uh, institutions can still function very well even without trust, and importantly, integration of markets can still occur 
um, without trust, uh, even in these, in these post-Civil War environments. Um, there are algorithms for peace treaties that show how institutions can be brought together, even under the most challenging of circumstances. And we can, you know, we've heard from several of the speakers, um, uh, including our keynote speaker of, of uh, Dr. Karaganov about uh, um, uh, quite a foreboding, uh, quite an ominous look of, of what's on the horizon. So even when reintegrating these separatist regions, um, there are you know, a variety of algorithms people can use. And I, I think one that's been the most promising is, is, uh, is giving weaker parties representation and power. Um, that uh, and ideally with veto power over, over key decisions. Um, short of that, all we have is, is dialogue. Um, and while more, more dialogue is, um, is still seen as a good thing, it's still systematically associated uh, with lower chances of, of violence in post-Civil War, uh, post War environments, um, lower chances of violence with more dialogue, it's not associated alone with lower levels of, of trade wars or, or sanctions. Um, in relation to, to rival domestic actors. Um, and you can see slight elements of that both in, in the Moldova, Transnistria and Georgia, uh, Abkhazia situations where Moldova and Transnistria, you are beginning to see an integration of some of the markets despite um, uh, the, uh, the many embargoes and sanctions that have been pursued, whereas Georgia and Abkhazia, you, you have not. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Carter. You uh, absolutely fairly mentioned that the institutions can function without trust. But the problem, including for the Eurasian Economic Union, for other unions, is that trust can exist without institutions. Uh, and uh, the institutions create some added value. So uh, we have two, two, another two speakers and about half an hour of time. So I, uh, without delay, give a floor to our friend and colleague, Jan Sin from the East China Normal University and Dr. Zhang. Uh, there is already a question for you uh, on uh, how do you think, can you add to your presentation please, on how do you think sure. this crisis, uh, this international crisis of trust, crisis of economics, crisis of pandemia, how it will affect uh, Chinese attitudes to uh, FTA policies, particularly with a group of states like China did already with ASEAN, uh, and uh, the negotiations which have been launched and going on between China and the Eurasian Economic Union. Please, please, uh, dear, dear friend, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. So I will um, briefly uh, comment on two uh, questions. One is the, the nature of this new protectionism, um, especially what's new there, uh, for what I understand. Uh, the second, well, we'll talk briefly, if time allows, the perception of uh, and practice of sanction from uh, Chinese, uh, mostly Chinese state. I won't touch on EAU that much, um, uh, but we can we can expand on uh, that in the Q and A maybe. Um, so, uh, briefly, I think the rising new protectionism, as defined by uh, our host uh, uh, research group in the global economy, not only in trade. Uh, to me, it reflects a fundamental dilemma in the uh, post-Cold War international system. Right? On the one hand, we see um, the, the post-Cold War globalization under the U.S. hegemony helped uh, uh, liberal principles expand, unexpected, uh, unprecedentedly expand to almost the whole international society. Right? Um, we see the universalization acceptance of this universal liberal principle in both in terms of geographic coverage and uh, its coverage of issue uh, areas. But we know from history, liberal internationalism almost always relies on some very rigid division between the uh, internal and external in order to maintain itself, right? Uh, we know some liberal thinkers uh, a few centuries ago actually think uh, imperialism is a liberal project. Uh, that will be a historical example. So the, ironically, the successful spread of liberal principles uh, into the whole global uh, scale actually undermines its traditional internal external di uh, division and then expose um, uh, the, this fundamental dilemma. That's one, one side of the, uh, the story. The other side of the story is uh, as a few uh, uh, speakers already mentioned, of course, is the re re recent redistribution of economic power in the international system uh, with the uh, primary 
example of uh, some of the so-called right emerging economies of rising powers. And they began to uh, highlight, uh, sometimes exploit, and uh, bring to the fore these internal tensions and the contradictions contained with, within this uh, more and more globalized liberal, liberal system, liberal system. Uh, without the intention or ability to offer their own universal values and systems and the practice. Right? So it is in this context, I think we began to see more and more reference to different type of coercive means in international economic life, including sanctions and uh, trade wars uh, defined by our Russian research team, uh, the so-called new protectionism. Uh, Dr. Makarov mentioned, right, uh, these protectionist policies were not new at all. But what's really new there is probably the context, the context I just described. Um, the context where um, those who uh, uh, propose and try to support a liberal system actually exhaust itself by successfully making it genuinely global. And then some other actors try to um, uh, take advantage of it, uh, uh, but without offering its own sort of uh, replaced uh, uh, its own universal system to replace it. Right? So I think that's the, that's the fundamental dilemma uh, I think our system faces. And uh, trade war, the new protectionism are to a large extent are a direct result of that, that fundamental uh, dilemma. Uh, that's the um, first part I want to uh, comment. And the second part is uh, China's position and perception of uh, these uh, uh, new uh, protectionism uh, measures. Um, uh, historically, um, at least since 1949, the, the, the Chinese states usually saw these uh, protectionist policies as instruments launched mainly by powerful states, and uh, use, usually denounce it as an immoral punishment, right? a punishment of the strong to those innocent and vulnerable uh, countries. And that was the attitude up until uh, at least in the late 1980s. But as all the uh, structural changes we have uh, witnessed, um, gradually uh, since the mid and late 1990s, we began to see also China's overall um, uh, international standing are on a rapid uh, change. It began to also challenge the theoretical and the practice, practical uh, value or relevance of studying and sanction as part of economic statecraft from uh, uh, Chinese uh, scholars and uh, state uh, agencies. Right? So um, there's a high expectation uh, among uh, the, the intellectual and the policy circles that China may quickly transform itself, willingly or unwillingly, from a main target of sanctions uh, uh, through active learning from being a taker of sanctions to develop its own um, abilities or even system as an active potential giver of sanctions and other means of economic statecraft. And uh, we began to see use of these economic means uh, against, uh, for better or for worse, Norway, uh, Japan, South Korea, North Korea, um, and uh, more recently probably will be more widely used in its economic relation with the US. Right? So in 2012, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China established a new Department of International Economic Affairs which symbolized the official recognition of economic diplomacy as an official diplomatic policy line. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, since 2003, there is a consortium of research centers being established and the annual conference convened to study these economic diplomacies. Uh, these are all uh, recent examples to show the increased interest and attention given to uh, these um, new economic uh, means. Right. So, and um, recently, for the very limited practice of uh, sanctions or economic, uh, 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 putative economic uh, policies, it seems there are a few uh, features of sanction policies uh, exercised by China. Uh, Chinese states prefers to use informal, opaque measures, including vague uh, threats, variation in its leadership visits, selective purchase or non-purchase to engage in highly focused short-term economic threats, uh, targeting mostly individual companies uh, in its uh, de facto sanction uh, policy package. Um, it would more or less uh, 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 fall into this uh, so-called smart sanctions st strategy. Uh, 
So that's uh, something on the rise, and we probably will see uh, the increasing use of these uh, tools and uh, practice in the uh, immediate future. Now, very quickly to the, to the um, uh, questions raised by um, uh, one of my Russian colleagues. Um, long story short, I think the pandemic uh, would actually push China to more actively push for economic openness and of international trade, but not on the same spatial or geographic scale. Certain type of degree, certain degree of economic decoupling with uh, its existing most important trading or economic partner, uh, which I mean United States, is more or less expected. Uh, but pushing for further free trade, further internationalization of uh, production chain, supply chain, or value chain on a different ge geographic and uh, spatial scale is uh, fully expected. So. FTAs with a uh, uh, new group of uh, countries or regions, uh, including uh, Southeast Asia, are completely uh, ex expected. Uh, um, and also, in particular, I want to emphasize how much the Chinese state and the major Chinese economic players emphasize uh, on the, 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 the importance of uh, resumption and the recontinuation of uh, uh, regional and global uh, production chain, value chain, and the supply chains. That's something I haven't heard um, that much from almost all other participants um, in the post, uh, post pandemic discussion. Um, but the Chinese participants from different walks, different circles, almost all emphasize that we need to still keep, keep the, the international division of labor, keep this international. Uh, uh, supply chain, um, but the, its geographic and spatial features might be shifted, uh, largely because of the shifted uh, relation between U.S. and China economic relations. So I think I'll stop here. Maybe expand on some of the points in the in the in the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Jensen. Uh, so we uh, the time is running. Uh, I'm very bad moderator. So I give a floor to our last speaker, Ivan Timofeev from uh, Rus Russian Foreign Affairs Council, and then we proceed to the short session of the questions and answers. Ivan, are you here? Are you with us? Yes, I am with you. Yes, Hello, Ivan, my great uh, Hi. <laughs> uh, Good morning, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, so, uh, while I'm supposed to speak about sanctions uh, uh, as a challenge for Eurasian economic integration, so now I must say that uh, I appreciate much uh, this uh, concept of new protectionism, uh, indeed, because uh, for quite a long time, uh, sanctions and trade wars uh, were uh, separated in the literature, have, have, have been separated in the literature. So that, that's a trend and there are um, good reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is that, um, well, trade wars usually are driven by business interests, by lobbies uh, to promote uh, national producers or to increase competitiveness on international markets. Uh, while sanctions are usually politically driven and uh, they are promoted by governmental authorities. So sanctions are, uh, in most cases, are a surprise for business uh, and it's a political risk. So business is passive in terms of sanctions, while there's more active in terms of trade wars. And in legal terms, uh, this division also uh, has been quite reasonable because um, uh, if you look at the legislation of key initiators like the US or the EU, uh, sanctions are uh, very uh, in a, uh, are separated from trade wars in a very clear way, both in terms of laws and in terms of decision-making process, especially in the UN or United States. However, what I noticed in the American literature uh, in recent years, not years, but in recent year, is that uh, these two concepts are uh, becoming uh, uh, are being merged to, in an increasing way, and uh, they are being merged in one specific case, the case of China, right? So when American scholars are um, approaching the Chinese case, uh, trade wars uh, and trade wars instruments like tariffs, for instance, are increasingly um, let's say, analyzed uh, in close proximity, in, if not in one basket, with traditional sanctions, right? 
So now, uh, so, so uh, this means that this concept of new protection protectionism, which was which is being coined by our colleagues from Vishka, uh, from High School of Economics, deserves uh, attention and further development. So as for uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, I have two points. Uh, they're very simple. Uh, the first point is that at current moment, moment sanctions are a low risk for integration. The second point is that uh, being a representative of political science, I have to be pessimistic and <laughs> I must admit that things may change. They may change uh, uh, fast and uh, uh, any radicalization of uh, political affairs may cause um, escalation of sanctions. And this is not just US-Russia relations. Uh, this is uh, also the relations between uh, US and China. So uh, before 2014, um, uh, before, before 2015 actually, when the uh, Eurasian integration started, uh, there was only one, uh, only two countries under sanctions, right? And the serious sanctions. Russia, uh, R Russian sanctions, uh, sanctions against Russia started uh, in 2014, so in 2012 there, there was a Magnitsky Act, but that sanctions uh, should not be considered serious. And Belarus was also under sanctions that time, uh, due, uh, the, the, that sanctions started in 2006, uh, uh, and uh, until now uh, there is a special emergency uh, in the United States, um, uh, by the way, and executive order which imposes sanctions against Belarus is still uh, in place. Uh, and there was a lot of noise around sanctions and Eurasian integration. The point was that uh, sanctions would stop, would block, would uh, not allow Eurasian integration to, 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 to proceed, to continue. And uh, these forecasts uh, tend to be an over, overestimation. True that um, key Russian financial institutions and energy companies are in the under, under the sectoral sanctions, but these sectoral sanctions imply only limited uh, amount of measures, like, for instance, limits for uh, the use of long of the um, uh, of, of debt instruments, right? Or uh, they are relevant for energy companies in a narrow number of segments. However, they do not block the international cooperation, international activity of these sectors of Russia. So uh, they do not affect seriously uh, the integration in this way, uh, neither in terms of primary sanctions nor in terms of secondary sanctions. Uh, one exception is uh, the uh, defense sector uh, and um, US legislation implies secondary sanctions against uh, companies and institutions which run significant um, transactions with Russia defense system, but defense has never been um, in the agenda of Eurasian integration. It's an agenda of CSTO, of bilateral relations with Russia, but uh, defense has never been in the list of Eurasian integration. So that, that by now that's not a problem. That's rather a problem of Russia-China relations, uh, but, but not the uh, Eurasian integration, right? Uh, so um, uh, actually now uh, the risk is still not high. Uh, of course, there is a pending legislation in the Congress, uh, the notorious DASCA, the third, which imply the escalation of sanctions. And of course, if, uh, for instance, Russian systemic banks, uh, right, like big banks, like Sber or uh, VTB are in the SDN list in the United States, uh, yes, Eurasian integration may face problems because um, banks in, the, in other countries of Eurasian Union may be a, a sub for US secondary sanctions. But, uh, the uh, amount of dollar transaction has been decreasing, transactions has been decreasing uh, in recent five years. So uh, the less dollar transactions we have inside the, the Eurasian Union, uh, the harder it will be for US um, financial intelligence to fix these deals and transactions and to punish banks. So they will have to rely on other instruments uh, with the, 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 on other intelligence sources, but that will require more efforts, right? So uh, by now, the uh, probability of DASCA and the third to uh, pass Congress are, is quite low. Uh, executive branch uh, is uh, critical towards uh, DASCA, for instance. Uh, we all remember the informal letter of Department of State Bureau of Legal Affairs, which 
severely criticized DASCA as being unnecessary. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, Congress is anti-Russian and uh, administration is pro-Russian. No, that's a very dangerous stereotype. They are both anti-Russian. But administration stresses that DASCA may harm US itself and US allies. And th that's true, actually. So, but, but we live in the world of politics. We live in the world of black, black swans. We live in the world of extremes. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, as Nassim Taleb uh, calls it, right? Uh, so uh, uh, we may face uh, political accidents, incidents, and uh, they may cause escalation. So we are not uh, guaranteed from this scenario. And that's why this worst scenario is possible. The Eurasian Union should think and work, work hard and work fast on the instruments, uh, uh, mostly in financial sector, which would allow to uh, guarantee that transactions inside the union uh, are secured from the external interference in terms of sanctions. And I would stress that this, uh, and I would finish with this point, that this is uh, not less important for Russia-China relations and the alignment of Eurasian Economic Union and One Belt, One Road, as far as China is increasingly uh, becoming a target for the U.S. sanctions and escalations there on that side may happen too. Uh, uh, we should also regard it as not just EU affair, but a, an affair and an, an agenda, a point, an important point of agenda of our relations with China and One Belt, One Road. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, well, uh, so now we, we have a couple, a couple of minutes for the discussion and and uh, first, I invite Professor Karaganov uh, for his intervention. Uh, first of all, it was a, a, um, a very uh, profound and enlightening discussion, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. I would uh, uh, give only three remarks. First, uh, I think you have to add, add to normal uh, uh, tariffs or sanctions or whatever instruments, the informational war, uh, because they are uh, uh, aimed at the same absolute at the same aim, uh, either but uh, either at uh, unilateral economic benefits uh, or else by or uh, uh, at uh, 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 imposing ec economic uh, pain uh, on the uh, uh, their opposing side. Uh, second. Uh, I would question uh, the uh, statement of Igor Makarov, who said, uh, in his brilliant presentation, uh, said that uh, uh, all these sanctions are for political uh, 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 reasons. Uh, they are, uh, largely, and on the surface. Uh, but uh, if sanctions and uh, protection greatest measures are aimed uh, at uh, uh, enlarging wealth of local producers, is it political at, at the expense of foreign producers and the expense uh, of uh, transnational business? Is it political or is it economic? I think we have to uh, uh, dig uh, uh, deeper uh, into that in our further uh, discussions and research. Uh, all the more that we are moving in the obvious direction, everybody uh, ag ag agreed on that. And the last uh, 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 notion, um, I think Dr. Likachov a few years ago, quite a few years ago, and, and Igor Makarov uh, termed, uh, uh, coined the term Asia for Asia. Uh, uh, whereas, I mean, more and more uh, trade, uh, Asian trade and especially Chinese trade is directed towards Asia. Uh, now what we see is an avalanche. It's not a, it's not a, a, a trade. I mean, the Chinese trade, as far as I understand, this year not decreased, but uh, uh, very uh, importantly increased, but mostly um, at the expense of Asian and Eurasian countries. And uh, what we could think about in the future uh, when and if, I mean, conditions uh, become uh, right, uh, is uh, that uh, new wave of uh, regulation and uh, liberalism uh, 
could be a dual towards Eurasia. Uh, and so a uh, whole Eurasia, maybe including Europe. Uh, and it will not come from Europe anymore, unfortunately, because of its uh, state of affairs. Uh, but maybe from uh, uh, China and uh, the like countries. We should think about that together. Maybe uh, within the um, hopefully upcoming discussions between the Eurasian Union and the European Union, though of course you couldn't expect much from them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Karaganov. We have uh, some questions. The first for Mr. Shadursky. Uh, which uh, is not exactly connected with the topic, but somehow related to it because it deals with the consequences of the sanctions and the mm. trade wars. Uh, the, the, the meaning of question is, as I read it, that uh, we have, in Eurasian Economic Union, we have a Eurasian court, which is a sort of an, an analog of the European Court of Justice, where the companies and the member states can address if they consider their treatment of the other member states being unjust. Uh, so, Mr. Shadursky, the meaningful question is that would you consider that Belarusian government or the companies will address to the court of the Eurasian mm -hmm. Economic Union regarding some trade limitations imposed by the other member state of Eurasian Economic Union? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, but I'm not historian of the court of Eurasian Economic Union, but I, I know some cases. For example, a uh, couple year ago, the Belarusian government filed a lawsuit to the court on champignons, on <laughs> export of champignons to Russia. And uh, but the uh, court supported the Bel Belarus recommended how to overcome their obstacles and uh, recommended to Russia to left, uh, to left the barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, certainly the main, uh, the main uh, problem or main um, problem in our uh, trade, uh, so-called trade wars, uh, is uh, uh, the dairy and sugar. But Belarus didn't use, uh, I mean, the Russian government didn't, didn't, uh, didn't use the court but they tried to solve, uh, solve the situation case through administrative procedure. As I know, um, in 2019, the Eurasia, Eurasian um, Economic Commission adopted the uh, decision number 11 uh, to recommend to Russia to left, uh, to, to lift, uh, to lift the barriers. But, uh, it means that uh, Belarus, uh, Be uh, Belarus prefer, uh, and other ca uh, countries, uh, as, as I know, prefer the administrative procedure, but not uh, judicial procedure. It means that the court uh, of the Eurasian Economic Union plays the poor role still. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Shadursky. Yes, indeed, uh, the, well, the regional, uh, the regional political systems define the application of the certain integration techniques, uh, and it should also be taken into consideration. So we have a, our friend Jan Sin wanted uh, to raise uh, a question. Uh, dear Jan, uh, I cannot find it uh, uh, in the, in the in the queue. Can you please say it again and uh, okay. so, name whom you're addressing it? Yes, um, maybe mostly for Professor Shadrowski, um, because he mentioned there uh, are a lot of discussion at the top within EAU as to how to uh, unify the, the rules. Um, I wonder he could give a very quick comments. What, what are the barrier against unification of these rules within uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Janzin, for this question. It's very long discussion, but I, I will try to, to answer very shortly. I think the ruling political, ruling political uh, elite of new independent states uh, don't, don't want to return to Soviet rule, uh, in particular mm. to Soviet hierarchy. Iraqi, because they want to be independent in a uh, new, new structure. And uh, certainly we see the saw, the main contradiction between Russian position and position from another side of Belarus and Kazakhstan to create economic union. But Russia prefer 
preferred to construct political union. I think uh, this is the main contradiction of our Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, f second, uh, second, uh, I um, uh, said that uh, elite, ruling elite, uh, they have no long, uh, long strategy. They have short period strategy. Uh, it means uh, to survive politically and to survive economically. And certainly they try to use Russian help, Russian assistance, to support their econo uh, economy. Uh, but certainly independence, independence is very important for ruling elite, but also uh, for, uh, for young, young generation. And uh, I, I, uh, the, the main intrigue of our future uh, Eurasian Economic Union, how their uh, new independent state, uh, its states, uh, uh, will construct a uh, competitive uh, political economic uh, system. Still, I think uh, political system, economic uh, system are living in the period of transition. Mm -hmm. uh, this is period of transition. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Fedorsky. Well, uh, as long as the Belarus is the um, present uh, state which is, has, holds the presidency, in the union and you have a head of the Eurasian Economic Commission. I see that the, most of the questions are addressed to you. This is not surprising. Uh, and there, but there, there is also a question from Carter Johnson to Arne Milchior on to what, the question is to what degree does you are the, uh, increasing new protect, see uh, the new protectionism as being driven by Trumpism versus being driven by broader structural factors in the global economy. So the question from Qatar is, Arne, do you think it's about Trump or it's about uh, how the life is going on and the global structural changes? Well, there are, of course, uh, uh, several reasons. Uh, first, you have the kind of recurring protectionism that you always had. In times of crisis, there is more anti-dumping, etc. In a way, WTO is a kind of defense against it, but it's legal and not so. But that you had all the time and you had a bit more the last 10 years. Uh, then you have, as mentioned by Mr. Marcado, the populist uh, trends. Uh, we're focusing on distributive issues about trade. So this changes the political climate and the environment of trade politics. But third, there is also the, the, the key point that uh, uh, when one major player in the global trade system, the founder of WTO, etc., changes its mind as as radically as uh, the United States has done under Trump, it's a kind of major change. So it was the USA that attacked the appellate body of the WTO. It was nobody else. And Europe and China are kind of agreeing that that was not um, a good thing to do. So. So, but of course, uh, if another president is elected, uh, the anti-China attitudes are still there. So, so it's not only about Trump, that's uh, for sure. So, yeah, so that is, uh, that is my question, that uh, there, are broader, there are broader issues, of course, but, uh, but the change of policy in the United States is one important uh, issue. Yeah, uh, thank you, Arne. Uh, uh, dear participants, I'm very sorry to inform you that we have exhausted our time uh, and uh, since we anticipate another session of this conference, even though we are acting not from, mostly not from our office facilities, but from our homes, I need to interrupt our exciting communication uh, and express my deepest gratitude to everybody who joined us this morning. Uh, we will put uh, the, the stream, the, we will put the record of our discussion on the website of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs, so everyone will have access to it. And uh, after the conference, in the two, three days, we will ask our junior researchers to draft a sort of intellectual analytical memorandum based on uh, the on our discussions and distribute this analytical memorandum uh, to our participants so we all can have these ideas on paper and then use them for the preparation of the other other discussions and meetings uh, regarding these exciting topics Thank you very much, and I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay.